Okay, so uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> how much time do we have? No, let me really know. Do we have like, what time do we break out? Five minutes. Uh, five minutes. <laughs> five minutes? All right. No, no. I was born in, in Brooklyn. No. Uh, how much time so do we really have? Any, any place within 30 and 45, and if we want to have more and more. Perfect. Okay. So I have okay. plenty of time. Mm -hmm. um, just if you have questions, just shout them out. Stop me. You're not going to throw me off. Um, I'll start uh, by saying, are there any questions so far? And that sounds funny because I'm not talking about what I'm talking about, but what do you want to know about pulmonary rehab? I know what I need to tell you, but if there's something specific, I want to make sure I get it. So does anyone have a, a specific question? I've got pulmonary fibrosis. Okay, and Where rehab, and rehab for pulmonary. Okay, perfect, easy. So, all right, so um, I'm the director of the Pulmonary Wellness and Rehabilitation Center. We opened in 1998. Um, before that, I was a chief therapist at NYU's cardiopulmonary rehab program. Um, I also run a huge Facebook group called Ultimate Pulmonary Wellness, and I have a book coming out before the end of the year called Ultimate Pulmonary Wellness. I tell you that only because I'm not advertising, all my stuff is free. So you're welcome to join us to read. The book is going to be free on the website. So when I think about Ultimate Pulmonary Wellness, okay, I think that there are five things that over the years are most important for patients in terms of lifestyle change. And I think you really have to think of it as what do I need to do to change my life? And, and you know, if you have pulmonary fibrosis or any other interstitial disease, you know that it's a, a big blow. It's a lifestyle change. But the things that overall I find to be the most important, and they're equally about 20% each, so having the right doctor and the right medical team, taking the right medications, taking the medications properly, 20% um, exercise and activity, 20% nutrition, eating right, maintaining a healthy weight, 20% stress and anxiety management and relaxation training, 20% and then prevention of infection because you know that you're going to be more susceptible to infection than the average person and an infection to you guys is not the same as an infection to me, okay? So I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of these. Again, if you have questions, by all means, stop me. Okay, I'm happy to answer any of them. So when we talk about having the right doctor, okay, the names that come up over and over again in this city, of course, Dr. Badia is at the top of the list for pulmonary fibrosis and, and interstitial lung diseases, okay? It's really important that you have a healthcare team that wants to get to know you as a person, that's going to understand your needs as a person, and that's going to look at the big picture and not just think, what are we going to do as far as giving you more medication, okay? Although medication is a giant part of this. Um, and also, it's important, in my opinion, for you to understand what you're taking, to understand what is going to be the impact on your body over the long term, but also some of the medications are going to have an impact over the course of the next five minutes or the next four hours or the next 12 hours. And by understanding those different things, you're going to be able to use them most effectively to get the most out of your day because that's basically what we want. We want to live as best we can, as close to our usual lives as we can, to have as few limitations from our disease and its symptoms as we can and to really feel like ourselves and be ourselves and understanding how you take your medicines, what you're taking, why do I take this, why do I feel this way now, how can I feel better is a, a key part of that. Exercise is huge, okay? When we talk about shortness of breath, okay, it's important to realize that most people start to get short of breath at high levels of activity. So in New York City, the thing that I hear most, walking up subway stairs, walking uphill, running for the bus. That's what I call the New York City pulmonary triathlon. And the thing is that there are people who will find ways, okay, naturally, human nature is that if my hip hurts when I do this, I'm not going to do that, okay? It's like you go to doctor, it hurts when I do this, don't do that. And it's the same thing with shortness of breath. So people get this idea that every time I walk up the subway stairs, I can't breathe, okay? They're going to find ways to not walk up the subway stairs. Maybe now instead of taking the subway, I take the bus. So think about it, if you're working and you are used to coming into the city five days a week and each time you come it's two flights of stairs, so that's four flights of stairs a day, 20 flights of stairs a week times 50 weeks if you get two weeks vacation, um, that's a thousand flights of steps that we're talking about. So if you switch from subway to bus and you walk a thousand flights less than you walked last year, you can imagine you're going to be a lot less fit. And so, as I mentioned, people typically get short of breath at high levels of activity, but then they find ways to avoid those activities. And as a result, all of the muscles that you use 
to do those activities get weaker, they don't use oxygen as well, and then you start to get short of breath at lower levels of activity. And what, a lot of times what people are surprised to hear, and you can tell me if you have the same experience, is that they say I'm much more short of breath, and then you have a pulmonary function test, and your pulmonary function test is unchanged. And, or you feel better, and you're less short of breath, and you go in and you're like, I can't wait to have this pulmonary function test, I'm sure it's gonna be better, and it's unchanged. So my point in saying that is to understand that breathing is really a multifactorial process. So it's not just lung function. And how your body uses oxygen is really based on three main factors. So of course, how good are your lungs at moving air in and out? How good is your heart at pumping blood? And then how good are your muscles at using oxygen? And like a car, so if your oil filter is dirty, if your spark plugs are old, if you don't have the right amount of air in the tires, each one of those things will give you less miles per gallon. Same thing with your body. So if you have a lung problem, then that's gonna decrease your efficiency. It's gonna decrease your body's ability to use oxygen. If you add to that a heart problem, pulmonary hypertension, something like that, that's also gonna make you less efficient. If you have a muscular problem or you're sedentary, um, that's gonna make you less efficient. So the point of this is that your body gets good at doing what you ask it to do. So if you ask it to sit on the couch and flip the remote, that is what you good at, get good at doing. But what I wanna say is that some of these things are reversible. So if you have gotten much more short of breath because you've all of a sudden become sedentary, then in the same way that people start to spiral downhill, we can start adding in healthy behaviors that help you spiral uphill again. And I think very often, you know, people hear, I have pulmonary fibrosis or I have interstitial lung disease or COPD or pulmonary hypertension, and a lot of what you read, you know, the internet's great, okay, it gives you a lot of information, but it's really not filtered in a way that gives you the best information necessarily. So it doesn't have to necessarily be true. And I think a lot of times people read, well, interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis is a disease where just expect it to get worse and then you die, okay? It's just gonna get worse and worse. You're gonna get more and more short of breath, but it doesn't tell you that there's a lot of reasons why you're more short of breath. So if all of a sudden you, you know, you used to work at, in a very physical job and now you don't, or you used to walk uh, two miles a day and now you don't, then that could be a reason why you're getting more short of breath. And I hate when I hear people say, you know, this is what you can expect or you can expect to live this long. There are numbers, but there's also many things that you can do to improve the quality of, of your life and to improve <coughs> the amount of things that you can do and the number of things you can do. So exercise is crucial, okay? so. As I mentioned, shortness of breath starts at high levels of activity. You eliminate those activities, your body gets weaker, your muscles get weaker. All the systems that you use to do those activities, like the aerobic system, they become less efficient. And so maybe before I got short of breath, walking up the four flights of stairs, now I have to stop at two flights. Now I have to stop at one flight. And now I say, well, you know what? It's not worth it anymore, I'm gonna take the bus. So we want to, of course, make you safe, but we want to keep you as active as possible and reverse the inactivity cycle, okay? And our goal is to, number one, teach you more effective breathing techniques, and there are a lot of breathing techniques that you can learn that will give you control of your breathing. Most people, when they get short of breath, you probably find that you're breathing very quickly and very shallowly. And when once that happens, once you're breathing 40 breaths per minute, I could tell you it's not gonna be long. You have to stop. And I think a lot of people walk down the street or they're walking uphill, and all of a sudden, do you want some water? Do you have some water? Okay. Um, you know, and you're walking uphill and all of a sudden you're short of breath and I think that's an obviously terrifying experience for people and as a result they no longer do these activities and that could be one of the worst things for you. So at the pulmonary center our goal is to break into that by number one teaching you more effective breathing techniques and then exercising you so that your body gets better at using oxygen. The, um, so as far as exercise testing and prescription and things like that when people come in, the first thing that we do is we do a physical exam. Okay, we'll go through your whole history, we'll do a physical examination, and then we do an exercise test. Most people are probably familiar with a six minute walk test, okay? I don't love the six minute walk test. I think there's a lot of variables that can change it and that can give you, um, you know, that can give you numbers that really don't reflect what you can and can't do. Of course, everybody uses it because it's a simple test. And the alternative to a six minute walk test is a treadmill test, which I love, or a bike test, okay? I'll tell you why I use what I use, okay? First of all, six minute walk test. You're controlling the test. So I don't know you, maybe you're sneaky, Phyllis, okay? So maybe you're gonna <laughs> maybe. say, you know what? If I do too good on this test, 
then they're not going to give me this, this, and this, or they're going to cut off my aid, or they're not going to give me my oxygen, or this and that. I, I'm sure you're not, okay, I'm sure you're very honest, but, okay, the point is that you as a patient can control that test. And so if you're walking, and first of all, I hate to say it, but often the tests are administered completely differently depending upon where you go. And if we go someplace where there's a long straight hallway and you have to just walk up and down on that versus a place where there's a quarter mile track versus a place where I have to walk around this table and keep turning, that's going to change the results of the test. The other problem with that test is that it's flat, okay? So if you do a certain amount, even like if you're running on that test and we find out that you could walk four miles per hour, which nobody can just because of the mechanics of the test, when you walk from 96th Street up to 98th Street, you know that that is not really giving us the right information because that might be a 15% incline. So the test I like to use is a treadmill test. Now, a lot of times I say to people, have you walked on a treadmill? And they say, yeah, I walked on a treadmill when I had my stress test. Now, that very often is a very bad experience for people. And they say, I failed my test. And part of the reason for that is because most of the diagnostic stress testing that's done for people is too much or the wrong protocol for patients with pulmonary disease. So as an example, there's a protocol that's called the Bruce Protocol, which starts at 1.7 miles per hour, 10% incline, which for most people here, it would throw you off the treadmill. So we don't really get the information that we need because what's going to stop most of you from being able to walk is not a cardiovascular endpoint that we would look for in a stress test. What stops you most of all? It's either shortness of breath or lower extremity fatigue. So your legs get tired, right? And the more short of breath you get and the less you do, the more your legs get tired earlier, okay? And the tests don't really give that information. We have a test that we use that was developed by one of my colleagues at, at, at NYU, which really, um, it's the perfect test because it starts at one mile per hour and it goes in two minutes stages. So if you can walk in, I can pretty much get six minutes out of you on the test. And that to me is more beneficial then a six minute, incidentally I did a six minute walk test on one of your patients today at, at your request, but we can talk more about that later. But th it's really important that we get a good baseline on you and find out what is limiting you. So if it's shortness of breath, we need to teach you more about shortness of breath, how to control your breathing. If it's lower extremity fatigue and your body's gotten weak and usually they come together, then we need to exercise you aerobically. And for a lot of people, you know, I'm glad to talk about oxygen but particularly for pulmonary fibrosis patients or interstitial lung disease patients, the oxygen requirements can be tremendous, okay? I first started taking care of pulmonary interstitial lung disease patients in 1995 when my old mentor, who's now retired, Dr. Pineda and I, we started getting patients who would come in resting at 90% and with almost any activity, they would be in the low 80s or 70s, and I'm sure a lot of people here have that experience. And part of the problem with exercising people in that condition is that a lot of places you go, they will lower the exercise so that you either stay saturated, which doesn't make any sense. It's like, you know, not trying to teach a student. It's like we keep the information so low so that you don't get lost. We want to get you, you know, we want to get you smarter and we want to get your body better. But the other thing is that if this is what you need to do your exercise and to get through your life, and I exercise you down here, which is what traditionally has been done in pulmonary rehab, you could do this till the cows come home, but that doesn't make you better at doing the things that you need to do every day. So I have a different philosophy, which is that I will give you as much oxygen as you need, uh, even if it's 100% oxygen. And incidentally, I don't want to you know, tell tales out of school, but most concentrators don't put out 100% oxygen. Uh, most of the portable concentrators that you get, they're not leader flow. So those are settings. So when you get something that says one, two, three, four, five, that doesn't mean you're getting five liters per minute, okay? That means a setting of five, and then when you read the fine print, you realize that, hey, guess what? I'm really only getting maybe a liter per minute if I'm lucky. So then the other aspect of it is, is that the pulse versus continuous. So the problem with a pulse, ox you know, a pulsed oxygen system, so if you guys are familiar with that, that means that it only delivers oxygen when you take a breath, okay? So you take a breath, it gives you a little burst, and that's as opposed to continuous oxygen, which means the oxygen is constantly flowing out. So the thing about that is that, you know, we have to get oxygen when we take it in either through our nose or our mouth that meets in the back, and we have to get past our windpipe, then it has to continue to go past the bronchi, which get smaller and smaller and gets into our lungs. 
But interstitial lung diseases and pulmonary fibrosis are what we call restrictive lung diseases, which means that you have problems with inhalation. So COPD is obstructive, which means you have trouble blowing out. These people wind up with big lungs, okay? People with restrictive diseases, they have trouble breathing in and they wind up with small lungs. And so as a result, because you can't move a lot of air with each breath, you have to take a lot of breaths per minute. So if you're going like this, <laughs> the air is going in your windpipe and out and in and out and in and out. And even though I'm giving you oxygen, we may see your oxygen plummeting. So part of what you have to learn is how to really use the device to maximize, to make sure the oxygen is getting into your lungs where you really need it. So in an ideal situation, so I'm going to say I don't like when people use the pulse, especially like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it like this. When it comes to oxygen delivery devices, there, there's an old saying. So it's like they say, if you want to have work done on your house, there's three things people want. They want it done well, they want it done fast, and they want it done cheap, right? So you can have any two of the three. So just as an example, you can have it done fast and cheap, but it's not going to be good. You can have it done fast and well, but it's not going to be cheap. Same thing with oxygen de devices. So people want three things. They want it to be small, they want it to give a high liter flow, and they want to give it, they want it to be uh, lightweight. And they want it to be small, they want it to be a high liter flow, and they want it to last a long time, right? Those things just don't necessarily meet with each other. So if you get a device, like if I get a device and I'm like, okay, this is gonna last for four hours, I mean, what do I, you know, I mean, use, in a lot of ways we have to say, does that make sense? Does it make sense that something this small, because we're talking about physics, we're talking about breaking up room air and making it oxygen. That's why I know it's not, it's not 100%. So my point in telling you this is not to bash the guy that was just here or say, you know what, you don't have the right, you know, but my point is to say we want to give you as much oxygen as you need to really stay saturated, okay? And if the device is not doing its job and you're still going into the 80s, then maybe it's not even worth you carrying that around because that... Well, can I ask you a question related to that? When we travel and he uses he uses his portable oxygen concentrator which is pulse right right mm -hmm. and so we don't bother sometimes we're away for three or four weeks from our home base right thing we and we're not bothering yet and so he sleep he's his one time where he's prescribed to have oxygen for sure is when he sleeps mm -hmm. because his oxygen concentration goes down are we putting him at risk is that what do you think? Mm -hmm. I mean, in my in my opinion, I feel anytime your hypox, anytime your oxygen is low, you're putting a strain on your body. You're, you know, it's increasing your chances. But is of that low if he's if he's you need to get an a nocturnal oximetry study with the uh, with, with the, using it with the exactly thing to and know see we whether we are uh, satisfied. Or alternatively, get a home base yeah. everywhere we go. Yeah. Always have a home base. Right. Okay. Not but we can uh, we can test okay. you. Okay. We can uh, get a study for that. Okay. You know, when it comes to pilots, okay, and when it comes to scuba divers, there are certain things that, that, that we know. We know that when you're looking out the cockpit of a plane, what you see is not necessarily what is. When you're underwater, how deep you think you are is not necessarily what it is, okay? And we get used to using our instruments, right? And so we look at these instruments, and what I tell people all the time is this, what number is on here is not, it's important of course, but this is the number that is okay. So this is the important number, the pulse oximeter. So if you are on six liters per minute on an oxygen tank and you check your, your saturation and you're at 80%, I don't care what that says, that's not enough oxygen for you and you have to figure out a way to get that maximum oxygen. So just going from worst to best, okay, the, the pulse is going to be the, the, the oxygen system that's going to give you the least amount of oxygen. It's going to last a long time, but like, imagine, it's like if I said to you, you just got out of the desert and you're thirsty, so you want a drink, right? So if I said to you, okay, open your mouth, I have this medicine dropper, and I'm going to give you one drop every half hour because it's going to last a long time. It's going to take a long time to quench your thirst, and it's the same kind of thing with oxygen. So I will give you as much oxygen as you need, and if you have a device, why would you carry around a device that's five pounds? I mean, it's like if I said, here's a bowling ball. Carry it, even a children's bowling ball, it's five pounds. Carry this around all day, every day. That in itself is going to increase the work of breathing, make you more tired, okay? And so if that's enough to get you from 89% to 95%, then that's a worthwhile investment. But if you're still 85% and you're still working to carry that around, in my opinion, that's not worth it and you need a better delivery device. 
So continuous, okay, so even if you have continuous, most of the machines that will go to five, again, not five liters, it's a setting of five, okay? So, and the way that I know it doesn't work, or the way I know it works less, less well, or is because if I put you on a tank like this and put you at five liters, and I put you on any concentrator at level five, you're always gonna have a higher saturation on a tank that's 100% medical grade oxygen. A tank like this is always gonna give you better than a concentrator, and a home concentrator on five liters continuous is always gonna give you better than a portable concentrator. So those are the things you have to keep in mind and you have to get to learn yourself so that you say, well, how am I? And we also wanna to try to match up how short a breath am I? Well, I feel short of breath, right? And sometimes we'll have people hooked up and they'll be like, oh my God, my heart must be beating out of my, my heart is beating so fast. And I'll say, how, how fast do you think your heart is going? I'll say, well, it's gotta be at least 130 or 140. I'll say, would you be surprised to know that your heart rate is 85? And they're like, what? My heart is 85? Oh, okay, 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 then I'm okay, okay. And part of what we try to do is we try to get you to match up what you're feeling with the vital sign. So what we do is every, every patient that comes in is fully monitored. So as you exercise, I have you on an EKG the whole time. Why? I don't like surprises. I don't want to guess. I don't want to rely on a pulse oximeter for an EKG rhythm, okay? It can't be done. I could get a rate, but a rate of 90 could be many different rhythms, right? It could be normal at 90. It could be an arrhythmia, still be 90. So we have an EKG on you, we check your oxygen every five minutes, we check your blood pressure every five minutes, and if I need to give you 100% oxygen, that's what I do. Now, if you have a tank like this, and you're on a cannula, okay, another mistake I see people make is they'll be on 15 liters with a cannula. Ineffective, right? A cannula is really only gonna be effective up to about six liters. And if you need much more than that, then you need to go to a mask. Another good thing is that if you're trying to conserve oxygen, so let's say, of course a cannula is the most comfortable, but if you just change from that to a mask, we could get you from probably maybe 28 or 32% coming out of that with a cannula that's going into you up to like 40%, 50%, 60%. So that's another way that we can kind of trick the system. Now, when you exercise, your body doesn't know that you're wearing oxygen. It doesn't know whether you're wearing a mask or a cannula. It only knows that you're exercising. And remember I said to you that your body gets good at doing what you ask it to do. So, you know, what we'll do is if I know that putting you on this treadmill on four liters, you're gonna desaturate into the 80s. And this is where I was going when I was talking about 1995, because we started seeing patients come in that by guidelines didn't even qualify for the program. They would say you're too sick for the program. And you say, well, if I'm too sick for the program, what does that mean? Like, is it like Alfred Hitchcock's lifeboat where we should just say, forget it, you're done, give up, okay? And that's not my thing ever, okay? Like when people say, oh, this is the end of the line, like to me I say, beautiful, this is the starting line. Here's where we are, let's figure out what we can do. And that means oxygen, okay? I'll give you as much oxygen as you need will give you up to 100% because again, we want that big workout from you because that big workout is what's gonna change your life. That big incline walking on the treadmill is what's gonna make you walk up the incline on the street. And so I'll give you as much oxygen as you need to keep pushing you up and up and up and up because again, if this is what your life needs and I exercise you here, you could do it for two hours a day. You're not gonna get better at your life. But if this is what your life needs and you need let's say 100% oxygen to do this, I will give that to you to work you out up here because again, your body doesn't know that you're getting oxygen. It's like we're cheating it a little bit, but your heart still gets better, your muscles still get better. The literature says that you can't improve pulmonary function with rehab. I have a, a different belief, okay? But I think that with traditional you know, rehab where you're walking very, very slowly for long periods of time, I don't think that that's the way you do it. I think the way you do it is by getting people working out very vigorously, safely, of course, okay? We're not looking to roll the dice with you, okay? That's not, I'm not like, hey, let's see if Mike is gonna, you know, drop if we raise them up. You know, we have a joke with Henry one time, we have a video where we say like, let's see, let's make sure that, you know, you're gonna be able to do this, but we wanna push you, and I can push you safely because I say, I'm looking at your EKG, I know what it's doing, I know what your blood pressure's doing, I know what your oxygen's doing, and if I have to raise your oxygen in order to do that for you, that's what I do, and then your muscles adapt to that, and your heart adapts to that, and I say that your lungs adapt to that, even though there are some people who, you know, will say that that's not true, but I do think, that you can get better and you can start to reverse these effects of the inactivity. Yes? My question is, and it's all beautiful what you're saying, but many of us at times have a very difficult time 
I move and you know try as much as I can but there are days when depression is part of this whole factor and I respect everything you're saying but we as the patient I think sometimes you're just not sure where you're going with it and the deep breathing I mm -hmm. think because the alarm goes off in your brain and says, I need oxygen. Right. Okay. So we do the, you know, that fast. So that's the big factor to know at home. How do we stop that panting and all of that real wonderful factors of breathing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree with you Besides 500%. Besides being in an environment like this. So you. here's how you do it. First of all, I think that there's a, a number of things that you need to know. So you, you're, you're saying depression well depression is a different story shortness of breath is a different story so there's different breathing techniques okay that will help you first of all you know and, and again every time I talk about you know breathing techniques people will say you know what this is not for, for pulmonary fibrosis it's for COPD but the first thing is this let's start with what I call a code red situation right so you're walking and you may be in the grocery store and you start to carry your groceries home and then all of a sudden you're like wait a second I can't breathe uh, I think I'm about to have a problem here and then you're right it goes to your head right the panic button goes so what happens when that happens your brain sends out a signal and that's you've heard of the the fight or flight response right so we have two we have the autonomic nervous system that I don't want to get into a crazy physiology lecture but you start to get short of breath and you're in the parking lot of Walmart and you're like oh my god I'm get, get sorry I'm gonna delete that because I not a Walmart subscriber, but I'm going to take that out of the film. <laughs> but, okay, but the point is you say, oh my God, I'm getting short of breath, right? And it may start with just a little shortness of breath, but then you start to do something very dangerous. You think, right? And you're like, oh my God, I might be getting into trouble here. And that sends out a signal to your body. It's adrenaline that's coming into your system. And that's this, the fight or flight response. But you know what the effect of adrenaline is? The effect of adrenaline is that it will increase your respiratory rate. Right? So you're going to breathe even faster. And it's going to increase your heart rate. And now you feel like your heart's beating out of your chest. And now you're like Fred Sanford and Sanford's son. You're like, oh my God, it's the big one. I think I'm going to be in trouble. So everybody is going to try to avoid that at all costs. Right? They're like, oh my God. It's like if you don't know how to swim, I'm not, you're not going in the pool. Uh, you're like, I'm, I'm not going in the pool. I don't even want to walk near the pool. Right? So you're like, I'm going to stay as far away from that as possible. Except remember what I was talking about before, which is how you start to avoid those activities. Now you're going to get weak. Guess what? Now that's going to start to happen over here before you even get to an unnamed big box store. Um, you know, but, but then it happens at lower and lower. So what do you do about that? Okay? The first thing is talk to yourself. Right? Remember that thinking is a dangerous thing to do at certain times. And you have to not say, oh my God, I'm about to get so short of breath that I'm not gonna be able to breathe and I'm probably gonna have a heart attack and I don't know if my anyone's gonna find me, right? That's the thought and it sounds funny, but it's realistic for a lot of people, right? And the problem with that is that when you start to shoot all this adrenaline out into your system, your body says, we better breathe faster and you go, <laughs> and it's like it gets shallower and shallower and then less and less air gets in here and then you feel like going, ugh, right? But most of us stop way before that. But what I want to say to you about that is that you have to talk to yourself. Right, absolutely. I do that. So what do you say? I can do this. Hey, okay. you close your mouth. That's what I have found. Okay. That you close your mouth because it's the panting that we all do, which makes it shorter. Closing my mouth and breathing through my nose. Really trying that. That could work, okay, but uh, I mean, but, but nose breathing is not, okay, but nose breathing is not necessarily, but here's, here's what I would suggest. I'll give you a few suggestions. Okay. So first of all, when you start to feel, you got to say to yourself, stop, okay, mm -hmm. I know what to do here, mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell you what to do. So after this, you'll know what to do, and I have this up on, on the website, so if you forget what I say here, you don't feel the need to memorize it, it's all up there for you to watch whenever you want, but the thing is, that let's say you're walking and you're starting to get short of breath. This is all about supply and demand, mm -hmm. right? So if you are, you know, you're sitting and, and the, the demand is kind of light sitting here doing nothing, you're kind of just watching, right? It's an exciting lecture, but you know, <laughs> you're getting a little bit of activity, but not as much as, as if you get up. So you stand right up and you're like, okay, 
this is more. So your body says, okay, I stood up, that's more than this. So I better beat my heart a little faster. I better breathe a little bit faster, right? But now I'm gonna walk faster. And now, a lot of times we don't even realize it. We're walking in the street and we're starting to think about it and most people hold their breath, right? By the time you get to the point where you can't breathe and you can't get another breath in, it's too late. So, but at that point, what could you do? You have to say, stop, I know what to do here, okay? And what do you do? The first thing you have to do is stop because if the demand is obviously too high and you can't supply it, you're not gonna catch up. So you're not gonna catch up by walking faster and trying to get into it. You have to stop. One thing you'll probably find is that this position is comfortable for people, right? Is this comfortable for breathing? And the reason for this is because when you, okay, there's something called open and closed chain activity. So like this is open chain. So my arms are out swinging freely. So when my, I'm in an open chain, the muscles in my chest, my back, my thorax, they do things like this, 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 this. But when I do this, okay, and I fix this, I call this closed chain activity. And what this does is this makes those muscles of the chest, thorax, serratus anterior, and they all work in their reverse action to elevate the ribs. So the intercostals are working when you're All of it, this. chest all muscles, back time. muscles, shoulder muscles. So when you do this, all of a sudden, now, now two things happen. First of all, your abdominal contents drop forward a little bit, okay? So that clears the way for the diaphragm to move more freely, unobstructed, but this also helps with the mechanics of breathing. So how many people have an experience where they say, you know what, uh, I walk from the car to the supermarket, I really get short of breath, but once I get in there, it's nice and cool, and I push that mm -hmm. cart. Any people have a benefit from pushing a cart or a walker or something like that? A lot of times people say to me, I can only walk a quarter of a block. And I say, no, you, no, you can't. You could walk more than that. I say, no, I'm telling you, it's a quarter of a block. And I say, here, try this rolling walker. And just fixing the upper body and giving them something smooth to move. Now, most <coughs> people don't want to walk around with a rolling walker, but there's an answer to that, okay? So the first thing I would suggest is come to this position where you're either leaning on something, you could lean against a wall, you mm -hmm. could lean like this, and that's going to put you in the best mechanical advantage to breathe. But then the other thing is you have to say, stop, I know what to do here, okay? When you're breathing in and out, and you're really in a, in a, in a, uh, a code red situation as I call it, where you're panting like that, you're breathing in one, out one, in one, out one, okay? It's like one step up, one step back, or one step up, two steps back. You have to get control of this, okay? Purslip breathing is something that is traditionally taught with obstructive diseases, but it also works with restricted diseases. And what purslip breathing is, is you do what's called purslips, you close your mouth and you, you just try to slow the breath, okay? And what this is like, you know like when your plane lands and all of a sudden they start putting the, the machine in reverse and the plane is slowing down, but the <coughs> engines are really just working to sort of slow, slow, slow. Similar principle to purslip breathing. And then remember that in one, out one is never gonna work. In one breath in is not gonna work. So you have to figure out a way to get more than one count of air into your lungs so that it passes the trachea, which is the windpipe, so that it could get where you use it. So I would stop right here, start breathing in. And everybody just, if you lean forward on your arms right now, I wanna just show you one thing. Think about how you feel. And then just take one deep breath. We're gonna breathe in for a count of three and out for a count of five. So just take a big deep breath in through your nose. And then blow it out gently through purse lips like this. All right. Does anybody feel different after that one breath? Just think about how you feel. That one breath sometimes is enough. What's that? Muscles of the chest feel very different. So just, that was one breath, right? You didn't even know what I was going to do. And, and one <coughs> breath just did that. It's like I just taught you a trick. But like now if you start doing that on a regular basis and you get good at it and your muscles become more tuned up so that I know what to do here. And then the other thing is don't wait till you're in trouble, right? That's what most people do. They say, oh, God, it's another block up to Saks Fifth Avenue. But they, they're like, I'm going to power up it. And they're like, Arr, Arr. or they say, I'm going to power up these subway stairs, right? And when you go on the subway, like it, it's like the running of the bulls. And you're like, oh, I don't want anyone to see me. I don't want to stop all these people. I better keep moving. And then you get to the top, what? I usually stop and do, you know, do that way. You made me late a couple of times, but no, but but but, but that's what you got to do. But but a lot of people are self-conscious about that. But a lot of people are self-conscious about it. So what they'll do is they'll hold their breath. 
Well, you're, you're ahead of the game then. But a lot of people will say, you know what, I don't want to be caught right here. I'm going to power up the stairs. And then they get to the top and they're first like, <sighs> and there's like little birds flying around their head and they're seeing stars. But the point is, I want to say it's all about supply and demand. So if you know you're going to walk up those stairs or you know you're going to walk up that hill, don't wait till you're short of breath. Start that breathing before you get there or any time you're I mean, active. Even before you approach. Even standing. before you approach. If, so if you're sitting and doing nothing and you know that almost any activity is going to cause you shortness of breath, any time I get up, even before I get up, I'm going to be starting to... I'm going to start it ahead of time. Increase the demand so that even if you have a little surplus, there's no such thing as too much oxygen, right? So start it ahead of time. Start to coordinate it with your breathing. There's something called pace breathing. So, you know, we'll time it with our stepping. So breathe in, in, and blow, two, three, four. Now, a lot of people say, what's the best ratio to breathe? There's no one best ratio for everybody. So you're gonna have to try it out. Okay, so ideally, you don't wanna breathe in for one. And a lot of times when you have trouble taking a deep breath, you'll find yourself breathing in, out, in, out. That's not really fair. So you have to work yourself up so that you can almost take at least a two count in. And that comes through conditioning, that takes through you know, practice and doing it every day. Um, but in the, again, in the same way that you spiral downhill, we can start to spiral you back uphill again. So a big part of what, what pulmonary rehab is, is learning those breathing techniques. So learning what are the most effective breathing techniques, what are going to give you the most control, what's going to increase the you know, supply in, in response to the demand, and then how do we use that to exercise you. Now again, we'll do our exercise test based on what we see. Another mistake that some people make is they'll, they'll think that they're supposed to work it out at 60 or 70 or 80 percent of what they accomplished on the exercise test. And the problem with that is that if you stop the test because you were short of breath or you stop the test because your legs were too tired, well, that's not a real cardiopulmonary endpoint. And so if I exercise you like, I, you know, I, again, I, I hate to talk about other programs, I won't name any, but every once in a while I'll get a test result and it'll say the patient did, we measure activity in MET levels, right? So there's something called metabolic equivalence and each activity has its own metabolic equivalent. So sitting and doing nothing is like one MET. Lying in bed and doing nothing is one MET. So if you, we say you're working out at eight METs, that's eight times the, the work that sitting and lying in bed is doing. So like a lot of times I'll get a, a test result and it'll say the patient did two METs on the uh, test and then they'll say exercise them at 60% of that which is 1.2 METs and I just told you that lying in bed is one MET so what does that mean sit there and here let me give you a margarita while you, you know you drink it so my point is you have to work out vigorously and depending upon what you get on the test if it's not a hemodynamic endpoint meaning that if you stop because you're short of breath or you stop because your legs were tired then I know that I have to overcome that and get you up working. And I want you at 100% of that, believe it or not, 100% of your, of your test within the first three sessions. And I know what's gonna happen because we've already taught you the breathing techniques, you learn them. And trust me, when you learn them, you're gonna start being able to use them. And then little by little, we want you to increase by 50%, 75%, double what you do the first time you come in. The most important, any questions so far? The breathing, do, do you ever incorporate <coughs> yoga breathing, which is a four, three, and seven. I don't. And you're talking about what Dr. Weil does. Um, I think I'm it's not a from here. Okay, so I, I think it's a I think it's a great it. thing. Well, Dr. Weil is like an international superstar of, of health, but it, oh, I you don't mean I, that one, Andrew, I don't do that. Okay, and the reason I just want to ask you, um, can you name one exercise you can do every morning? Yes. And, and one food that you can do can eat for your lungs that will help your lungs. Okay, so I'll, I'll start first of all with the breathing. Do I incorporate, I will get to that, do I incorporate yoga breathing? Only if I'm doing yoga, okay? Because there's better things. That's a great exercise and it's great for stress relief and it can sit here and give you a feeling of well-being and it can help to open up your lungs and relax the airways. And that's a great thing to do, but not during exercise because I don't think you're gonna be able to maintain it during vigorous exercise. What if you can't do vigorous exercise that you've been told? Then we start you wherever you are. <coughs> wherever you are today, you can do it. I'm not saying you're... No, I say there's spinal cord compression and the doctor said absolutely nothing. What can you recommend as a physical, a so, doctor, a physicist? So everybody, so everybody can do something. There's nobody who could do right. nothing, okay? Right. 
Uh, the point is that everybody's got something, okay? My average patient is 80, average, 80 years old. I last week had seven people in the room at the same time that were over 90, okay? So the point is you don't get to 90 without some, I'll tell you what I hear the most. So I hear some heart disease, but most people have hypertension, high cholesterol, osteoarthritis, uh, GERD, okay? These types of things. But there's something for everybody. So if I say you can't do any exercise, then what does that mean? You have to stay in bed right but we can work around it so maybe if you have a spinal stenosis or something like that it's going to impact you and it's going to allow you to walk less a lot of people they their legs start to get crampy because they have spinal stenosis and that also is going to impact it but that means we treat whatever the underlying issue is as well or at the same time as we do that we also have an orthopedic rehab you know program within our practice just for our patients because yeah you're right if you have osteoarthritis of the hip and you have bone rubbing on bone then maybe walking up the treadmill at 10% incline is not for you but there's a lot of different exercises that will put the the pressure on other different areas or take it off so that's a goal but that requires an individual evaluation by your doctor and say well these are the things you know that we we have up going against us uh, but what can we do? Maybe it's a matter of medicating you. Maybe it's a matter of giving you a brace. Maybe it's a matter of you getting some physical therapy so that you could do the big program. So going on to the question of one thing you could do every day, the single best exercise, walking. Okay, you don't need any equipment for it. And you know, the, the great thing is like, I love these things now, it makes it so easy to track your steps. Um, so you say, I come here, I can't do anything. I can't do vigorous exercise. I'm not gonna put you on the same program that I would put uh, 25 year old and vigorous is to different people it's different to different people so wherever you are today that's our starting point so there's nobody if you got here today you walked at least several hundred steps to get here okay and most of the smartphones now you could track your steps for free um, there's a lot of different ways of doing it it's better than a pedometer but I would say if you're doing nothing right now let's start out with a walk program and you're not going to go to rehab so I assume not everybody's going to go to rehab of course the ideal is everyone's going to go to rehab not everybody has the ability to do that. Not everybody's insurance covers it. Not everybody gets referred for it. But you, if, if you're walking today, one of the best things to do is always get a baseline. So if I say, well, I want to start an exercise program. I don't know where to start. Well, what am I doing now? I know now I get up in the morning, I walk to the fridge, I get my breakfast, I come sit down, I watch three hours of uh, Maury Povich, and then I go get my lunch. So you know, you say, what am I doing right now? And then we want to add to that. And don't add too quickly. You make a good point. So if you add too quickly, you're going to get hurt, especially a lot of my patients come to me. They haven't exercised in 40 years. So if it's been 40 years since you exercise and we overdo it with you, yeah, you're going to develop some overuse issues. You're going to get bad hips. You're going to get a bad. The last thing we want you to do is come to us and get hurt. So ideally what's going to happen is we're going to start you little by little and wherever you are now, even if you have to use a 60 minute walk test or our treadmill test or whatever it is, or you just say, let me walk outside and see how many blocks I could walk. And you walk out and you say, I'm going to walk around the corner and see what I can do. And I could walk a half a block. So you know if you could walk a half a block today, then my goal is going to be walk three quarters of a block. And if you're, you know, occasionally we do see people who are doing almost nothing, okay? But then if that means that I can only do a little bit at a time, then you need to do it more frequently. So maybe that means three times a day you're going to get up and you're going to walk a half block. And I know that if you do that, okay, then you'll be walking three quarters of the block, then you'll be walking a block, then little by little you start to increase it. But again, all this stuff has to be done after a good evaluation by your doctor. You wanna make sure that you're cleared, you wanna make sure that you don't have a heart problem that's gonna interfere with what you're doing as well. Um, but walking is the single best exercise, okay? And again, you get good at doing what you ask it to do. So the reason why I don't like a bike test is because how many people here bike around the city? probably nobody right so I could test you on the bike but you used to but but most people don't but everybody walks what's that but but again you want to start if you know we have to say where are we right this moment okay and what can we do to increase this so it's about you know learning to breathe better getting the exercise as far as food that's a whole different ballgame okay but if I want to talk a little bit about nutrition you know and it comes to pulmonary disease okay once you start to be breathing heavy all the time okay you start to burn a lot of calories and your metabolism goes up so one of the big issues with particularly lung uh, interstitial disease patients or patients with pulmonary fibrosis is that they start to lose weight and it's a double-edged sword because it's like you you say well how do I gain weight you eat a lot but 
How many people can eat a big meal? No. When you eat a big meal and it's sitting here, it affects the mechanics of breathing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people will say, okay, well, I don't understand this. The other day I went out to dinner with my wife and we walked to the restaurant four blocks and then on the way back, we walked a half a block and I had to call a taxi to get home. It was so embarrassing. And I said, I don't understand what happened. He said, well, I understand what happened. Well, what did you eat? Well, I had a, a fried calamari and I had pasta and I had dessert and I had alcohol. And all that stuff sits right here. So here's your abdominal contents. Your diaphragm sits up here. The diaphragm normally contracts downward. And that's what causes the lungs to inflate. But if I have pasta and steak and calamari over here and I have two glasses of wine, every time your diaphragm wants to put down, all that food's going to no, no, no. And you get more short breath after meals. So it's hard to have a big meal. So same type of thing. If you have trouble taking in calories, then you need to eat more frequently, smaller meals. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that carbohydrate, you know, when you eat a, a lot of carbs, that produces a lot of carbon dioxide that also sends a message to your brain that says breathe, 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 breathe. So if you have a giant pasta meal and it's all white processed pasta and things like that, you may have a hard time breathing after that. But if you're trying to gain weight, then things like healthy fats are going to be great because fat has nine calories per gram versus protein and carbohydrate which has four so it's all connected you know what I mean that's why I say you can't hit one without the other and if you're not getting adequate nutrition you're not going to be able to perform so again I don't want to bludgeon you with information in an hour but I'll talk just a little bit about exercise and then I'll open up to questions but exercise most important exercise is aerobic exercise so aerobic exercise is basically what's going to help your body use oxygen the best and it's going to be things like walking it's going to be treadmill it's going to be the bike it's going to be the new step it's going to be the upper body ergometer it's going to be anything that you can sustain for a long period of time and again long is relative so if you only did three minutes on the treadmill today then next time I may have you do four minutes but I may have you do it twice Generally, it's about the 10 to 15 to 20 minute mark where people start to get become aerobic. They start to use aerobic metabolism, and that's where their breathing gets better, and that's where they start to, you know, but a lot of people can't get up that, that high at first, so they quit. Because, you know, so there's anaerobic metabolism, there's aerobic. So anaerobic means it's, it's not really using oxygen as its source. So a 100 yard dash, that's anaerobic, but a marathon is aerobic, and I'm not advising anyone here do the 100 yard dash or the marathon, but what I'm saying is that you have to have a sustained amount of exercise. So aerobics are very important, and again, walking, treadmill, exercise bike, new step, <coughs> upper body ergometer, anything like that is good. Swimming is a great exercise, but a lot of people with respiratory disease have a difficult time in the pool because of the chemicals, and if that's an issue for you, then that's something that has to be worked out. Strength training, so we lose strength. Strength. The difference between strength and aerobics, so strength is I have trouble getting out of the chair. I have trouble getting on and off the toilet. I have trouble walking upstairs. But most exercises are aerobic, anaerobic. They're a combination of both. So I, did, I really divide them up into aerobics, strength training, flexibility exercises. Um, and most people who are sedentary will get some strength benefit, some aerobic benefit, and some flexibility exercise benefit from almost any activity. So if you do nothing now, and you start yoga and you're standing in this position for five, you're going to get strength benefit from it. You're going to get flexibility from it. You're going to get some breathing benefit from it. Same with the treadmill. If you're used to doing nothing and all of a sudden you start treadmill, even if it's not fast, you'll get some aerobic. And, and you know, a lot of times people like to classify things <coughs> into this is this and this is this and this is this. It almost doesn't matter what you do. So Nike says just do it. My, I say I'll tell you, just do something. Because if you're doing nothing right now, you can definitely get better. When people come to me and say, I can't do anything, I say, well, are you exercising? Uh, no. Are you eating right? No. Are you doing any type of stress management or relaxation training, meditation or anything like that? No. Well, let me see you take your medications. Well, you're not taking those properly. Well, what are you doing to prevent infection? Do you get the flu shot? Do you get the pneumonia vaccine? No. So unless you're doing all those things, then you're not at your best. We all have a range. So like I know if I eat right, if I exercise, if I do all those different things, I can be in great shape, I'm still not going to play for the Knicks, I'm limited, I have a range, okay? You all have a range, and our goal is to get you to the top of your range. Um, general points about rehab, so generally our program is twice a week or three times a week. Each session lasts between an hour and an hour and a half. You don't 
exercise for that whole time, there's rest breaks built in. A lot of times people say, can I work out once a week? Just to let you know, not to try to get you not to work out once a week, but once a week is really like zero times a week. So you have to work out at least twice a week, three times is better, something daily. Like if you're, think of yourself and ask yourself, where am I in this continuum? So if you're an old rusty car that has been sitting in the backyard of, you know, not moving for a long time and we want to get it moving, it takes a lot to get that moving, right? Until we get some momentum. It's the same with the body. So the less you've done, actually the more you have to do it, the more frequently. So the less you can do, the more frequently you can do it. You, you know, you have to do it. And I promise you, it sounds like, you know, you, you know people say, oh, that all sounds very nice and good. Um, it does sound nice and good, but it's the truth. You know, I mean, this is not an infomercial here. I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years. We don't have patients who don't get better. Like, we just don't. We don't have patients who don't make improvements in 24 sessions as long as you come. Okay, as long as you come and you show up and you do, you, you don't have to think about it. All you have to do is come come with us. And you're right, it could be depressing, okay? It could be depressing to have a chronic disease. It could be very anxiety provoking to have a chronic disease. And listen, we've been to programs where you go in and it's, 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 it's depressing. I mean, it sounds terrible and everyone's going, oh, this is terrible. We've all been in support groups where people go and say, my life sucks, and then the next person says, well, mine sucks worse than yours, and then the next person says, well, you think yours is bad? Look at hers, you know? That's, if that's where you are, you wouldn't be here today, okay? And that is really based on the tone that's set by the people running the support group. So if the support group will tolerate that, and when I say tolerate, don't get me wrong, I'm not gonna be like, oh, you know what, uh, Phyllis is complaining. No, it's not like that, but if you believe that you're gonna win, as a coach used to say, I mean, if you think you're gonna win the game, if you think you're going to lose the game, either way, you're going to be right. If you think things can get better, they can get better. They really can get better, okay? Until you're gone, until you're dead. Until you're dead, then they can't get much better, probably. We don't know. But, you know, at, at least as I see it, I haven't seen a patient yet who cannot be in some way we can help their lives get a little bit better. And same thing for support. So when you go someplace, you're going to be like, this is terrible. Yeah, mine is getting worse and worse and worse. If you do nothing, okay, pulmonary fibrosis, it's not a joke. It's like the ocean. It's big. It's fat. You know, it, it's strong. It doesn't get tired. So that means that it's always going to be working against you. That means if you want to beat it, you need to pull every weapon out of your arsenal, and you need to not give up until that's it, until there's no choice in, in giving up. But if you want to fight, we'll fight with you. And that means online, that means in books, that means at the center, but also it's in, it's the, the biggest thing right here is in your mind. So and if your mind sure says you can't you do think it, you are. What's it? And I'm not saying like, oh, I think, um, I'm not sure who I look like more, <coughs> Brad Pitt or George Clooney, you know? I mean, if that's what you think, awesome. And that's yeah. what you look, and you can go up and be like, hey, Phyllis, what are you doing after meeting? Um, you know, that's that's cool, and some people are like oh, that, you know. Like George today. Oh, there you go, there you go. But but my point is that it, 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 it's not like you're gonna think you're an athlete, and now I'm yeah. entering the next Olympics in Japan, but it means, you know what? I'm tired of this. It's like people say, well, I'm in quicksand, right? I'm sinking in quicksand, and over here is a tiger. And over here is a lion, and over here is an alligator. Okay, yeah, that's scary, but I know where I am is not good. So maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna get in trouble when I go out there, but maybe I have a chance when I go over there. Okay, if I stay here, I know I'm sinking, and I know it's only a matter of time. So my point is, if you're ready, you know, to get going, and it's it's up to just saying this: I'm ready to go up going. And again, I'm not saying ready to come to the pulmonary wellness. I'm saying, you know what, I'm ready to make a change. And I haven't done any walking today. Tomorrow is the day I start my walking. And that's what I'm gonna do. Tomorrow is the day that I spend five minutes every morning doing the breathing exercises. Tomorrow is the day I'm gonna start meditating because I know that my shoulders are so tight from breathing so hard that I need to do something to relax this, you know? And little by little by little. And one thing that's great to do, keep a diary. Go out, get a book that's just for this and say, you know what, today I'm gonna write down everything that I do, everything that I eat, every activity that I do, how many glasses of water I do, everything I think. And then little by little, you can start to say, what's similar about this? How do I feel on a scale of one to 10? Today I feel seven. Hmm, also, how do I feel tomorrow? I feel like I have a 10. Well, you know what I'm starting to notice? That on the days that I have a bacon cheeseburger and fries, my breathing is only at a six, but when I have something healthier, my breathing is at an eight. And guess what? Look, also on the days that I'm at a nine, it's when I ate healthy, 
and I exercised. Or on the days that, wow, how did you have a 10? On a day that I had a 10, I exercised in the morning, I had a healthy <coughs> breakfast, I did some meditation, and then in the afternoon I got to see my family because that's a part of it also. You know, my goal is not to make you live for rehab. My goal is not to make you live to do all the, my goal is for you to do these things so you can live your life, okay? The motivation is not to walk 20 minutes on the treadmill. The goal is to be able to walk enough that you could go to your grandson's graduation or to your daughter's wedding or something like that. And you have to really look at it and say, what are the things that are important to me and what has become so deconstructed, how did I wind up in this place right here and how do I get out of here? And I'm not gonna say it's magic, okay? Pulmonary fibrosis is serious. Interstitial lung disease is serious. It's always working against you, but who's your team? Your team is your doctors, your team is your therapist, your team is your family and your support system. And the, the, the question really is, are you ready to fight? Am I ready to make a, a, a choice? Because the, the fact is, it's against you. It's, it's working against you, you have to work hard against it and use all the weapons that you have. You do that. Um, you you work at the, um, Mount Sinai. Uh, no, we work with the doctors from Mount Sinai, but we have a practice on 38th between fifth and sixth. We're freestanding. We don't affiliate with any hospitals. So we still uh, we have you know uh, we have some brochures. We'll give them to you um, again. But there's rehabs at, at every hospital. I never want you know if Mount Sinai is closest to you. Mount Sinai does have a, a rehab program. Columbia has a rehab program. And the best place to go for you. I mean, of course, I'm biased, but you know it's going to be whatever place you're going to get to. Okay. If coming to 38th between fifth and sixth is so unpleasant for you because you spend eight hours in traffic, then go wherever's closest to you. Um, another thing is, you know, how do we, you know, make it more pleasant for people, okay? What makes it happier? Color, okay? If you look through these brochures, our colors are yellow, you know, pro we have art everywhere, we have music, we have karaoke, we have a dog walking around. Um, you know, the, the key is, what are the things that make you happy? Because if all these things don't make you happy, what's the point? You know, I mean, we don't want to live long and unhappy, we want to live long and happy um, and feel good, and, and if not, then, you know, Questions. Can you no, walk? Oh. Um, can you walk on the spot for five yeah, minutes? Yeah, you can walk. Can good? I? Probably not. I'll get tired after four and a half. But but yeah, anything five you minutes. look. Let's put it this way: you're sitting, you're doing nothing, right? <coughs> so think of it like this. So you know what my exercise is? Here's my exercise, right? <laughs> it's probably not aerobic, but it's more than what I was just doing a second ago, right? This is more than that. This is more than that. So yeah, can you do this? So if I'm going to do this, I'm going to start. I feel like Richard Simmons all of a sudden, but I'm going to be going. <laughs> Like when I was in jail and I was in the hole, I had nowhere to move around. You know, I only got to exercise one hour. No, I'm just joking. Um, but 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 yeah, you could do it. Okay, the the thing I know you you did believe me because I looked like a ruffian. It took me a long time to break into the pulmonary world because they're like, I've seen that guy before. I think he was on the poster in the in the post office. That was you, right? They're like, I made to, need to make a quick phone call. He's here. No, he's at Mount Sinai. Um, I had question about. Oh, sorry. The countering the sentiment, you go up steps, I'm just going to power up the rest of those steps. Right. I don't want the people behind me to be obstructed by me stopping. That is a really strong uh, psychological thing. But how can you, what kind of a head game do you suggest for someone to play with themselves? This, this is what it is, okay? It's, it is what it is, okay? It, you have a choice. So I can say, listen, this is New York City. so. We fight this game every day. I mean, we're lucky if we actually get someone to look up while they're walking up the steps from their smartphone. But you know what? You stop. I mean, I have to do it. I'm gonna. I mean, sometimes. What are I'd, the psychological, not psychological? What are the physiological damages that you're doing by powering? That might. So be here's some. Here's what happens physiologically. Okay. First of all, I'm holding my breath. Breath holding is bad for you on a number of different levels. Okay. So very simply. This is our thoracic cavity, this is our abdominal cavity, right? Think of it as a suitcase. So the more, you know, we're all packing, right? And at the end of it, we try to go, how much can I get in here? We're squeezing, squeezing. In. So if you, the higher the thoracic pressures, the higher the abdominal pressures, the more difficult it's gonna be for you to breathe. So if you're holding your breath, that's called Valsalva maneuver, right? So our pressures are going up, okay? The, it, you have pulmonary, certainly if you have a lung 
issue. We don't want your intrathoracic pressure going up so high, particularly if you are in a position where, you know, we don't want you to develop a pneumothorax or a lung collapse or anything. So same, same with scuba, same, I mean, scuba is my number one thing. It just works perfectly with cardiopulmonary disease, but holding your breath is what's gonna make you at risk for a lung collapse or an overexpansion injury. But also your pressures are going up if your oxygen could be going down because we're, we we're still have the high demand, but we're not supplying by breathing. And then the other thing is that very often when people have restrictive lung disease or any lung disease over the long period of time, pulmonary hypertension is also a problem. So pulmonary hypertension is, is pressure on the right side of the heart and the pulmonary circulation, and that's certainly not good for that either. So we want to keep the blood and the oxygen and the air flowing all the time, but particularly when you're most active. And again, I would say turn up your oxygen at those points. Um, you know, go up to the if highest. You're not year. using oxygen. You're just you're not yet. Breathing. Yeah, then you should be breathing. breathing. You should be like, you know what? I'm sitting on the train. I know they're about to open the gate, and all these bulls are about to run down the streets okay. of you know whatever. So I'm gonna start my breathing now because you know what? I'm already thinking about it. I'm already getting nervous, and that adrenaline's going out, and I'm starting to breathe fast. So I'm gonna be like. Or another technique is, you know what, I know this is gonna happen, I'm gonna stand at the bottom of the steps until the first rush goes, okay? The, let those people go, I'm gonna be catching my breath here, and then guess what, they're all gone, and I'm gonna be like. You also have the advantage then is that if anyone dropped anything out of their pockets or anything like that, <laughs> you get to take it with you, and you know, hopefully, everyone's gonna get you. lucky. Sometimes you get something you don't want, but, um, and then, you know, just one, point about you know prevention of infection so the you know one of the biggest ways that people get something is touch you know hand to hand to mouth or hand to nose combat I call it and you know especially if you take public transportation okay you're holding on that pole and it's like we had an x-ray light and we could see what all the things were on it's like that commercial uh, where they're talking about the kids and they say pass up your papers and the kid in the back has it and it's all over there I mean we've all had the experience of touching something in New York City or we go into a taxi and it's wet or something like that and you're like ew you know so I always recommend people you know carry some type of hand sanitizer if you can't wash your hands but wash your hands frequently uh, 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 you know throughout the day because anything you touch is you know touched by everyone who's touched it before you so that's one thing but yeah I would say and I just thought of now I don't know I've never thought of that before but wait it's I'm not a subway person but it's like wait at the bottom of the steps let these people go that's a time for you to do your breathing get ready and then just go up nice and peacefully and hope another train doesn't come so How about lifting weight? Lifting weight is great for you. You need muscle strength. You need everything. You need muscle strength. You need flexibility. And you need to be able to sustain it. But that's a part of it, okay? All these things should be part of a rehab program. There's none that should be the be all and end all. Although, if you're going to choose one over the other, I would make it aerobic. Because, like I said before, you do get strength benefit from aerobic activity too, especially if you've been sedentary. The ideal is to do as many things as possible because, again, each one is specific. So, kind of like Walking on, you know, uh, a bike when you're doing this kind of activity, that's what you need to walk upstairs. Walking on a treadmill is what you need to walk on flat, or you know, turning the incline up is what you need to walk uphill. But the thing is that the more of them that you do, the better it's going to be for you. But given one piece of equipment, I could still condition somebody, you know, perfectly with just a treadmill and some strength training exercises. So, other questions. I know it's a lot of information. Uh, again, I have like 32 webinars of like a an hour and a half to two hours up to my record two hour and 29 minute webinar. Um, there's like 80 hours of me talking if you like that, uh, you know, that is, uh, but I also have great, you know, guests. I have like tip top specialists from each specialty that come on and they're all free. Watch them, uh, you know, and, and don't watch them all at once. You'll, it's, it's not like uh, the, uh, you know, Homeland Marathon. Don't watch all pulmonary wellness in one weekend. You'll your brain will explode. But um, but it's there for you. It's free. You know and and, and Do you it, have a specialist on about anti sympathies? I do not. No one ever does. No, I do not. Sorry, but it's something we yeah, can think because about. Because that's what I have, and I've had four infections within less than a year. No, we don't, but, but we do have multiple about like keeping your lungs free of infection. And you know, like when we talk about infection, so if, how do you prevent infection? So of course, you know, take your medications right, frequent hand washing, you know, pneumonia vaccine, flu shot, but also if secretions are an issue, 
then, you know, and secretions often aren't an issue with pulmonary, but, you know, you could go to some of the secretion clearance devices like an acapella valve, the, the aerobica, things like that. But we do have a couple about prevention, infection, keeping your lungs clear, which are good for everybody. Other okay. questions, comments? Wonderful. Thank you so Thanks. very much. Right. Thank, Thank you. I kept it short, so. <laughs>